So a lot of people have been asking about control theory and so we're going to go over in this video. Uh, control theory is like a really, really complicated topic and to do it well you need to have a really complicated or really in-depth understanding of a lot of complicated math. We're going to try and avoid as much of that math as we can um, because it's something that when we started doing dress factor control that we didn't even really know about. We're now sort of starting this learning process and you know we've made some good progress and understanding like what actually goes into control theory. But for now, we're going to try and keep this very broad and at a very a relatively high level so that you don't need to understand, you know, an entire three year degrees worth of mathematics. All right. So before we dive into the depths of control theory, there's some very broad overarching terms that we should probably clarify. And one of these first things that we should clarify is what is control theory? So basically it's how we get electromechanical systems to respond the way we want. You've definitely used something that uses some form of a PID controller or maybe even a more robust type of control system in it before. Um, even something like the thermostat in your house probably uses some form of control theory or some form of feedback loop to make sure that your house is nice and toasty or nice and cool, depending on how you like it. Um, another term that we'll want to define and we'll use a very extensively in this video is a PID controller where essentially the P stands for proportional, the I stands for integral, and the D stands for derivative. And we'll get into what all of those mean later on in the video. I feel like our videos um, kind of unintentionally provide a really good learning path about why control theory is important. Because if you look at our very first two videos on our channel, that's our very first rocket, and that had no control theory whatsoever. So whatever angle the rocket was sensing, it would pitch the thrust vector mount too. And so that's like no control whatsoever. And you could kind of think of it as like trying to balance a pen on your hand. And all you can do to balance the pen is move your hand at whatever angle it starts to pitch over at. And you can kind of intuitively tell that that's not how we want to respond to things. We want to be able to look at how fast it's changing, how far off its actual sort of set point or vertical point is and respond to all of those things at the same time. And that's essentially what a PID controller allows us to do. All right, so let's travel back in time to April of 2019, where we conducted our first hold down test of our very first rocket or first version of Spectre. This was using our Lego thrust vectoring mount and our uh, very janky breadboard um, or proto board flight computer. As the motor comes up to thrust, the rocket starts to have these increasing deflections. So it pitches one way and that pitches back over the other and these exaggerate. And so we can see it's doing thrust vectoring, sure, but if it wasn't on a hold down mount, your flight would be very sketchy and sort of borderline unsafe. So that's why a control algorithm is so important. And so if we then look at our next series of hold down tests um, that come later that year, you'll see that we then introduce a PID algorithm. And for this PID algorithm, we kind of did some rough calculations in Excel to get some like some ballpark numbers that we, we thought looked like reasonable PID numbers. We did some research on sort of similar systems and what PID uh, gains those would use. And so we plugged those in, did the hold down test, and we got really lucky um, that we didn't need to do any more tests. But based on how we were planning to do it, it was going to be a case of hold down test, get some data back on the SD card, look at that data and tweak our PIDs accordingly. Now, from an engineering standpoint, this is a terrible, terrible approach. And like companies like SpaceX or Blue Origin or anyone, like they would not approach the problem like this because essentially what you're doing is you're wasting money, right? Because every time we have to test it, we're burning through a motor. And so if you're okay with taking and kind of accepting that cost to avoid the math, then sure, it's reasonable. But from an engineering standpoint, you can do it much safer and much more robustly by actually developing a really good model of the system and testing that instead. All of it is defined by this equation, which looks really daunting, but if we were to kind of step through it, essentially each time we compute our PID algorithm or our PID, each time the flight computer goes through its control loop, it looks at what is the current angle of the rocket. So if we look at this in one dimension, we say the rocket's pitched over five degrees. Okay, so there's an error based on our reference of zero degrees of five degrees. So that's where the summation comes from. 
We then look at the proportionality of that. So the proportionality of that is five, right? Because there's a difference of five. We multiply that by our P gain. The integral gain is gonna slowly build up over time. So if we're five degrees for 10 seconds, then we'd integrate these five degree pitch over for 10 seconds, and that would be multiplied by our I gain. Then lastly, our D term is our derivative. And so that's gonna be looking at the rate of change of this error. So if we're five degrees, but that's changing very fast, then our D term is gonna be increasing and that's gonna get multiplied by our D gain. So that's where all these gains come from. And that's kind of one of the key parts of this PID tuning is picking your gains. All right, now you may be thinking to yourself, this PID stuff's pretty cool, but it doesn't really make my flight computer very smart because all my flight computer is doing is responding to what's going on around it. And it's not actually doing any thinking per se. And you'd be right. And that's where this stuff called state space control comes from. Um, so control algorithms like an LQR, which stands for linear quadratic regulator or various other sort of multiple input, multiple output state space controllers come from. And essentially what that does is the flight computer has a sort of understanding of the physics of the system on board. And so it kind of knows that if it does this thing, it can predict how it, the system will respond based on these physics that we've defined. And so that can make for really, really robust controllers. Now, they're not as common as a PID controller because to develop them is pretty complicated and to really like tune them is takes a lot of effort and a lot of understanding of your system. But if you're trying to do something difficult, like land a model rocket, then you definitely need to use something like state space control because your flight computer essentially needs to be pretty smart. SpaceX, Blue Origin, and most rocket companies, they'll use state space control because it's so robust and it's kind of what you need to keep a really stable and accurate flight path for something as complicated as a rocket. So PID control is maybe good for this small scale stuff when it's relatively basic. If you just care about thrust vectoring on ascent, you can definitely get away with using just a PID algorithm. It'll serve you really well and you can get some stable flights. In essence, there's kind of no really easy way to do this control theory stuff and thrust vectoring a model rocket is inherently difficult. But if you want the dumb and sort of quick and easy approach, not necessarily dumb, but the quick and easy, hit it with a hammer until it works approach, chuck your rocket on the test stand with you know, some educated guessed PID values, away you go, and just keep trialing and erroring. Or you can try and develop a rough sort of simulation that you can use to test these PID values. Um, I know some people can do that or have done that in Excel. You can do it with a software like Simulink in MATLAB, or you can even do it in Python and actually have some visual um, sort of simulation with that. But in essence, there's no way that you can avoid doing sort of some aspect of this really complicated topic. And that's kind of what makes it so interesting. And there's so many cool advancements and so many like learning opportunities that you can get from doing this. Yeah, so thank you guys for watching. Um, hopefully you didn't get too bored of all of this complicated math and talk about control theory and stuff. Um, I find it really interesting, but maybe you didn't, maybe it was really boring, but Thanks for sticking around. Um, make sure to subscribe, smash the notification bell to make Luke very, very happy. I know he's not here today, but he'll be over the moon if you do. Um, feel free to talk to us on Gmail. The Gmail is orionaerospace.liftoff at gmail.com. We're on Instagram too, at orionaerospace, and Twitter at aerospaceorion. Make sure to follow us on all of those because as we work on our new rocket, we're gonna be dropping some secret details on all of those. And we're almost at a thousand subs. So thank you guys. We're all right there. We're really close. And there's going to be a lot more new content coming. So stay tuned. It's going to be really cool. This new rocket is going to be unlike anything anyone's seen on YouTube. Maybe ever. Maybe anywhere. It's going to be sick. So thank you guys for watching. And we will catch you in the next one. Rockets out, as he would say. I don't know why he says that. I, we, we still don't know why he said that in the first place. But he did. And now it's kind of stuck. We're kind of, we're, we're screwed really. We have to keep saying it. I don't want to. Hugh makes us. I'm so sorry. Thanks for watching. <laughs>